Amen. Well, this evening we're looking at eight verses in Luke chapter 13. And it has to do with an incident of our Lord Jesus uh, healing on the Sabbath. You know, it, it almost appears as though Jesus did that on purpose so he could uh, raise the controversy and deal with the issues. In this case, mainly the hypocrisy of the Jewish leaders. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at, um, at the passage. Let's read it, verses 10 through 17. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath... And there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, there are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated, and the entire crowd was rejoicing over the glorious things being done by him. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our uh, understanding, to our uh, edification being built up this evening. Now, I remember this morning we were looking at what Jesus uh, said to the Jews when they tried to deflect from his call to them to deal with their sins before they come to the judgment seat where it would be too late. He reminded them that none of them were safe because all have sinned and deserve God's judgment. And as uh, they brought up the example of what Pilate did to the Galileans and what the example, as Jesus brought up the example of the tower that fell on the 18th Siloam, Jesus said to them, the only reason why Pilate ha hasn't killed you and a tower hasn't fallen on you was because God is patient. He's not willing that they would perish but come to repentance. That certainly applies to his covenant people, Israel. And as we understand from Scripture, he desires mankind as well to come to him. But Jesus also re remember, or reminded them that his patience that was saving them was eventually going to run out. As Jonathan Edwards and his sinners in the hands of the angry God uh, said, you know, that thread, that spider web that's holding you is one day going to break and you're going to fall. And while it's still holding, you need to come. So they needed to repent. They needed to come to him now. Well, this evening, uh, we see Jesus finally moving on to another situation where he's continuing to preach the gospel as the Lord continues his patience toward his people. Now he moves from speaking to the crowd uh, outwardly, or at least outside, to teaching in a synagogue. Now we don't know exactly where this event took place. Luke is really the only gospel, gospel writer who records this event, and he doesn't actually tell us. But we do know from what Luke is telling us here that Jesus is making his way towards Jerusalem where he's going to lay down his life uh, for his people and, and for us. Now, he could have been then either in Galilee or Judea. He certainly wasn't in Samaria. And it's likely that he was in Galilee because we do need to notice here that, that um, this synagogue was open to him. I mean, he was invited to teach. And that wasn't happening so much in Judea where the Jews there very strongly hated him. But one thing we do know is that what he did here, again, provoked a controversy with the Jews, uh, reminding us that Jesus never, you know, held back from speaking the truth. He always spoke the truth, even though he knew very well what, what the truth would do. Now, what I want us to consider from this passage are three things. First of all, Jesus' act of mercy that ended in controversy. Uh, secondly, what the controversy was really about. 
And then thirdly, how Jesus settled the controversy. So first of all, we see Jesus' act of mercy that ended in controversy. Luke writes in um, verse, um, let's see, verse 11. And there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. The first thing we need to notice here is that it was a spirit that caused her sickness. Obviously not an angelic uh, spirit, but a demonic one. As our Lord will point out later in our text, she was bound by Satan. Now, we do understand from the gospel writers that uh, not all sickness was due to demonic activity. It wasn't then, certainly isn't now. There were those that were just plain sick. I mean, that's what the fall does, is it, it basically is causing everything to run down, and so we get sick. But in this particular case, it was caused by a demon. Now, one thing we notice about uh, the gospel accounts is that there was a lot of demonic activity going on in Jesus' day. I think as we read the entire Old Testament, we don't see nearly as much going on during that time frame as we do in Jesus' day. And we need to ask the question, why is that? Well, it's likely because of two things. First of all, because of Israel's sin, and particularly against the light they had and the privilege they had with God. They had fallen away from God. So far, the Jesus, uh, well, I should say Israel is represented in Matthew's gospel in Matthew 4.16 as a people sitting in the valley of the shadow of death. Okay, so things are dark. There is darkness all around them. And the further that a people go away from the Lord, again, particularly as they have privileges, uh, the more Satan's kingdom is actually able to intrude in that place. So one of the reasons why there was so much demonic activity was because these people had fallen away from the Lord very far, as we see from the Jewish leaders. Now, the other reason is because of God's glory. The Father sent His Son to a people when they were in darkness, so that when he shone the light, they might see it more clearly. I love this illustration that J.C. Ryle points out in his book, Christian Leaders of the 18th Century, which is all about the Great Awakening, both in England and in New England. He points out that after the Lord had basically exploded in Europe with um, these tremendous revivals, the Reformation, right, the Puritan era that followed. Uh, Just, again, if you want to see the quality or the character of that revival, read some of the literature that came out of that time. It is so much more uh, in-depth, so much more spiritual, so much more insightful than anything that's being written today. Well, after he had basically exploded with all of this light into these areas, England and America fell away into great darkness. But that was just simply preparatory, as J.C. Ryle points out, to the Great Awakening, which was another great revival that uh, we know something about from George Whitfield, Jonathan Edwards, the Wesleys, and others who ministered during that time. The Lord often allows things to get very dark before He bursts on the scene with His light because it's much more, you know, visible in the darkness. Now, if that pattern holds true, then we know that this country that we live in is very close to another revival, if the Lord is willing. Now, there are many downsides, of course, of this darkness, at least least while it's here, as we're well aware of from our own country and what's going on here. But in this case, we were looking at demonic oppression. There was a great deal of it. Now, here was a woman who had been doubled over for 18 years, essentially bent, bent over, and she could not straighten up at all. We can only imagine how difficult life would have been for this woman, and certainly our Lord Jesus Christ knew the difficulties that she was going through, and He had compassion on her. Uh, we read in verses 12 and 13 of Luke 13, when Jesus saw her, He called her over and said to her, woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. 
Now, he, he, he did this not just to raise a controversy. He did this because he's full of compassion, full of mercy. You know, the word compassion means to suffer with someone. When you see somebody suffering, you feel their suffering. When Jesus would see someone in need, he would feel, sense what they're going through, and he would reach out to do something to help. The author to the Hebrews tells us that he is perfectly suited to be our great high priest because he can sympathize with what it is we're going through. That's one of the reasons why he became man, was that he might experience what we have to go through so that he would be able to help us. But again, he is sympathetic. He is compassionate. The love that he gives to us for our neighbor is really meant to move us to do the same. We should not be unmoved by the suffering we see going around us, but we should do what we can to try to relieve it. Now, when Jesus saw her, he told her to come. And we don't know exactly why he didn't go to her. Maybe he was uh, wanting her to come to him in order to show that she had the faith that uh, she needed in order to be healed. But when she came, Jesus told her that she was free. And he laid his hands on her. And immediately she was healed. Immediately she was, she was you know, her bonds were loosed, her chains were, were removed, and she straightened up. Jesus did miracles with great power and authority. Nothing could withstand him. When he healed somebody, the effects were always obvious. The effects were always immediate, except when there was a reason to delay that healing. And I'm not sure that we know exactly why it was delayed in the case of the man who had the clay applied to his eyes. Remember, Jesus spat on the ground. He made clay, applied him to the eyes of this man, sent him to the pool of Siloam, and said, wash. Maybe it was because he wanted to get him to a place where there'd be more people who would be able to see him. But usually, when Jesus commanded the demons, when he commanded the sickness, when he commanded anything, he had authority over all things, they would immediately obey him. I point that out just, just to say again, if we're not already convinced that people who claim to do miracles today aren't really doing miracles, their miracles are not the same. They're not of the same variety. I'm not saying God doesn't do miracles today, but I don't, I, I don't believe he does it through the people who are claiming to do the miracles because their miracles can't be seen. They can't be verified. You just have people saying things, but you don't see anything going on. When Jesus healed, you would see it. It would be so uh, amazing that you would, you would wonder and marvel. You'd be actually afraid of what you had just seen because you knew that only God could do it. That's the kind of miracle that Jesus did. And one other thing we should note is that Jesus' miracles, again, were always miracles of mercy. They always benefited those that received them, reminding us again that Jesus is not only our shepherd, but he was the shepherd of Israel. And as the great shepherd, he tended to the needs of his people, didn't he? These were his people. So he was healing them, he was teaching them, he was doing what they needed to do. He is the one who cares for his flock. And then one thing, one final thing I want us to notice about the woman here is the effect that this miracle had on her. As soon as she was delivered, she began glorifying God. It may have very well have been that this is her conversion, right? She came to Jesus and she was saved. It's hard to imagine the, a demon holding a true believer in that, in that captivity for 18 years. I'm not sure that, that could happen. But in, it's likely that she was saved and she began glorifying God, which is what our response should be. When the Lord delivers us from the enemy, we should give him glory. Now, seeing this, this, this powerful exposition, exhibition of the power of God and the mercy that the Lord showed to this woman, we might ask the question, who could possibly object to the love and the mercy that Jesus showed this woman. Well, Luke tells us that there were people there who actually did. And that brings us to the second point, what the controversy was over. It wasn't over the fact that the woman was healed. It was over the fact of when she was healed. Now, we read in verse 14 uh, this, But the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, there are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Now, of course, we know this was the Sabbath day. That's the reason why they were in the synagogue in the first place, right? Because 
That's the reason why the Lord gave, at least one of the reasons, why He gave the fourth commandment, why He gave a Sabbath, a day of rest, was so that His people, including us, might have a day in common where we can meet together and worship the Lord. Now, the official's concern was that Jesus had done work on the Sabbath. And, you know, when we read the fourth commandment, we might get the impression, at least at first glance, that, that he was right. Let me, uh, let me read Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. This is in the Ten Commandments, and the Lord is, is basically making his covenant with his people as he delivered them out of Egypt. And, of course, they're ingratiated to him because he's just redeemed them, he's just delivered them. And so he says, now you're my people, and this is how I want you to live. And he gives them these ten words. Well, this is the fourth. Moses writes, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. By the way, when I said Moses wrote this, we understand this was written by the finger of God in tablets of stone. And Moses copied it then into the, into the scriptures, so we would have a copy of it as well. Well, what does this commandment tell us? First of all, that God wants us to remember this day, remember the Sabbath day, to remember that he's given it to us, to remember that uh, it's meant to be a blessing to us, uh, that it is a commandment from God to observe it. And I think in a society like ours, it's very easy to forget or to neglect it. He wants us to keep this day holy. And the word holy means to set the day apart from all the other days of the week to be special, to be a day for God. Okay? Anything that is holy belongs to Him. Well, God wants us to set it apart so that we might spend it with Him. This is His time with us. He knows that we have a lot to do in this world, a lot of work to do during the week, and He gives us six days to do that, but He wants one of those days, and He's actually very jealous for that day because He loves us. He wants us to spend this time with Him, and since we love Him, we want to be jealous for this day as well. But again, he's given us six days in which to get all of our work done, and we should work. He wants us to work, but he wants us to get it all done in those six days. But on the seventh, that is his day. Now, we know originally, uh, according to the commandment that I just read, uh, this day marks God's rest after the work of his creation, which we would call the old creation, which was destroyed by sin. And certainly, that's what we just read in Exodus chapter 20 in verse 11. Uh, God created the heavens and the earth six days, rest on the seventh. Therefore, you know, you shall work six days and rest on the seventh. But the day today marks Christ's rest from the work of the new creation uh, on the day he entered into his rest. Because we know from what Paul tells us, when Jesus did the work that he did, he not only uh, made us new creatures in Christ but he's made the whole creation new. And just as we have not actually received that, that newness except in our souls, our bodies are still a part of the old creation and are going to die. Um, so the old creation doesn't really yet show what it's going to be like when the Lord comes again and brings in the new creation. So God originally did the work of the old creation and the seventh day Sabbath was meant to commemorate that. But in the new covenant, it's the first day of the week that we celebrate because this is the day Jesus entered into his rest, the day he rose from the dead after completing the work of the new creation. This is the Sabbath of the Lord. Now, notice what the Lord said. On this day, we are not to do any work or cause anyone or anything under our authority to do any work so that we can rest and ideally, of course, Worship the Lord. The official's complaint was that Jesus broke this commandment, clearly, because he did a work. He healed this woman. Now, again, we just saw God tells us not to work. But remember, not all work is wrong. 
We may do things that are necessary on this day to preserve our lives. We may do things that are necessary or merciful to preserve the lives of others, as Jesus shows us over and over and over again in Scripture. What Jesus did here was an act of mercy. And mercy on this day was a good thing, as he was about to show the official, because the official actually does the same thing. Now, finally, we see how Jesus ended this controversy. Jesus answered this man who raised the objection as well as the other Jews because you'll notice he moves from the first, per or actually from singular to plural, okay? He says, you hypocrites, okay, this is the way he began. His answer to him, uh, this isn't exactly the way that we have been taught in our culture to win friends and influence people, is it? But this was the right thing to do because Jesus always did the right thing. Now remember that a hypocrite is somebody who says one thing, but who does another. These Jews said one thing. It's unlawful to do work on the Sabbath, but they were doing something else. They were working on the Sabbath, okay? They were caring for the needs of their animals. Verse 15, but the Lord answered him and said, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? Jesus, you know, was not saying that what they were doing was wrong, you know. What they were doing was necessary work. That was okay. What they were wrong in doing was condemning him for what he had done. I mean, his argument is essentially this. If you can untie an animal and lead it to water on the Sabbath, how much more should you be able to untie this woman, you know, to loose her bonds, her chains, and lead her to living water? He says in verse 16, And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, one of your fellow countrymen, one of the members of God's covenant, one of my people, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? I mean, what is the answer to that is, is quite obvious. And um, the result, of course, was that these um, Jews, these Pharisees, it, it may have been the official and remember the elders, how they like to sit in the front facing the people. It may be they all ended up <laughs> with, you know, with egg in their faces, right? As he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated. Okay, so... Speaking the truth was humiliating to them because they were holding on to a lie. This was purely hypocrisy. They were saying these things against Jesus perhaps just to tear him down. But notice it had the opposite effect on those who were watching, the others, uh, the, the audiences that were the crowd. In verse 17, we also read, the entire crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things being done by him, including putting these religious leaders in their place. Now, again, this reminds us that there's always two responses to the truth. We'd like it to be just one, positive, but there's always two. There's a, there's a negative as well as a positive. There will be those who are offended by the truth, those who have some stake in maintaining the lie, and there will be those who receive it by God's grace and only by His grace because our first reaction will always be, to resist the truth, particularly when we're unconverted. Our first reaction as believers should be to receive the truth. But remember, unbelievers will only receive the truth by God's grace. So Jesus exposes their hypocrisy, again, humiliates them, but again, brings these other people to a state of rejoicing. Now, in closing, let's just apply the different things that, that we have seen here just briefly. First of all, I think we need to remember from the example of Jesus healing this woman that our God is a God of great mercy. I mean, just as he sent Jesus to heal this woman, so he sent Jesus into the world to do something far greater than just physical healing. He's come to heal our souls. He has come to heal us. We do need to realize, even though we may not have been doubled over, like she was for 18 years, we did live many of our years chained by Satan. We were bound by him, but unlike the woman who was very unhappy that she was in that condition, 
the physical condition, we were happy to have been bound by the enemy. We really didn't know any different. We didn't know where we were headed. And we may have been concerned about that, I think, if we had known. But we were happy to be his captives, and we enjoyed doing what Satan was encouraging us to do. But we need to realize in that condition, we would have perished forever. But the Lord had mercy on us. He opened our eyes to our chains, to our predicament. He opened our eyes to the beauty of the Savior, and He gave us the faith to embrace Him. He set us free through the gospel. And so we should be thankful like this woman. What was her response when the Lord healed her? She began giving glory to God. I'm sure that was verbal, and we need to be doing that. We need to be giving glory to God and worshiping Him as we're gathered together. The reason why we do this is because He has freed us from our chains. He has set us free from hell. And he has given to us a a glorious home in heaven. We need to glorify him with our mouths, but we also need to glorify him with our lives. I would imagine that woman used her newfound ability to go and serve the Lord. Okay, that's what we need to do. That's the only proper response. We should be reminded by this, secondly, that the Lord has given to us a Sabbath day. Okay, the Sabbath. And it's meant to be a blessing and, and not a curse. Now, it is true that there are certain things that the Lord tells us to do on this day. Rest, okay? Rest so you can worship. Give others a break. Don't make them work. Don't make your animals work. I don't, we don't have too much of that problem today. But he's also told us there are things that we are not to do. Don't work. Don't do unnecessary work. Don't immerse yourself in the world that I'm trying to get you to break off of for a little while to spend time with me. So don't be here bodily, but, but be outside with your mind, and certainly don't just be out there when you can be spending time, he says, with me. So there are things we should do and things that he doesn't want us to do, but I think we understand when we see things the way that they really are, that it is for our good. The Lord is not you know, releasing us from one set of chains in order to put us into another set of chains. He's not tying us up on this day to make us and other people suffer. That's not his purpose. We can take care of our needs. We can help other people. We can evangelize. But most of all, we have a a commandment from the Lord to put aside all the other distractions and the things that that would really take away our time during the week in order to spend with him. So we need to see the day as a blessing. That's how the Lord intends it. That's how he intended it from the beginning. He blessed that day for the sake of man whom he had created. And then finally, as we're serving the Lord, we need to understand there's going to be times when we're going to be called to confront the lies of the devil, even as Jesus was confronting the the lies of the enemy through the mouths of the leaders of Israel. He's calling us to expose the world's evil and the world's hypocrisy. And in order to do that, we need to be equipped with the truth. Uh, You know, Jesus was one who learned the Scriptures as he was growing up. As a man, he had to learn. He grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And uh, he learned to use it skillfully, right? Um, We need to become more skillful in the Word. Uh, We need to know the truth. And we need to be willing to defend that truth and use it. Now, our enemy has sown a great deal of lies, his doctrine, in the hearts of the people in this nation. Really, it's all around us, isn't it? We need to be able to counter that by sowing God's doctrine so that they might escape the devil. We need to be able to engage in arguments. You know, we call it apologetics. We need to be able to share the gospel. We need to be able to point out hypocrisy. We need to be able to show why evil is evil and why good is good. Now, it doesn't mean that they're going to agree with us if we happen to make a good argument and if we present the gospel. As a matter of fact, the Lord tells us most people will not agree with us. But we need to remember that there will be those who will. And that is the encouragement, isn't it? The Lord has people who are His. And as we share the gospel, Christ says His sheep will hear His voice and they will follow Him. But the way they're going to hear the voice of, of the shepherd is, is through us. 
So we need to be equipped with the truth. We need to be able to use the truth skillfully and perhaps engage in apologetics if, if that should be the situation that we're put in. But we especially need to be able to share the gospel with the confidence that God is going to do it and be willing even to you know, suffer um, hatred, ill will from others for so doing. But if we do suffer ill will, let it be for the truth. Let it be for the gospel and not for the way we actually bring it to them, okay? Sometimes we can not be gracious, okay? We, we need to be gracious, and we need to exhibit Christ-like character as we bring the gospel. Well, may the Lord um, apply his word to our hearts as uh, we need to hear it. Let's bow in just a moment of prayer and ask the Lord to help us apply it.